I was very lucky. The Ark was a tremendously happy ship. We, and this has proved the fact that we're, we're, we're so close even now. But when just, we, it was to be our last trip. We were not going to have another uh, trip down the Med after that one. We were going to Norfolk, Virginia for a complete refit. We'd steamed 205,000 miles without a refit. And it was arranged we were going to Norfolk, Virginia. Now, when that arrangement was made, um, the crew were asked, would they like to return to UK or remain aboard the Ark? Now, we'd been in commission for three years, and two of those had been during the war. And yet more than 50% of the ship's company were prepared to stay aboard, which was showed a lot, I think, of, of how happy a ship it was. There was a lot of feeling there, and I, I as I say, I, I think I was immensely lucky to be a part of that. Perhaps the best-known carrier in the fleet at the moment is the Ark Royal, and a similar type of carrier, very much the same in appearance, is joining the fleet that is, the new illustrious class. Ark Royal has a full-length flight deck, one funnel to starboard, and a light mast. Note how the flight deck overlaps the stern and the stem, giving Ark Royal a rather closed-in appearance. Everybody knew it was the last trip. We were reinforcing aircraft to, to um, Malta. We'd done that. We'd planned them all off. We were in 30 miles of jib. Uh, and I was walking on the flight deck with Frankie Lewin, the squadron commander, wondering what was going to happen next because we knew that the ship was long overdue for a refit. You know that Ark Royal had 500 tons of concrete in her double bottoms? from bombing damage and all those other things that she'd been through. You know that she hadn't had a single refit since she'd been launched in 38, 39, 40, 41. No ship had steamed harder and faster, been subjected to more bombing than that poor old vessel. But no, it had no, and, and to plug up all the leaks and things, the watertight hatches, half of them wouldn't fit. They were all distorted. The whole ship wanted to be re reinforced or chained. It was all right, closed water tight doors. You try, I said. But you know, all these things never get sort of shown up. And who's responsible? Well, not the, you can't say that the admirals and the battleships, they didn't have any such uh, exposure. The enemy were far more intelligent than to bother about bombing battleships. They didn't give a damn about battleships. They wanted the carriers. They knew the carriers were the most dangerous thing that floated in the waters. So poor old Ark got very, very battered. She really needed it. So when one torpedo struck at about four o'clock that afternoon, well, we didn't think that was the end either, good old Ark. But what with all her battered doors and her dead bottoms and so on, it was too much in the end. I was very prejudiced, having spent two years as a midshipman in HMS Nelson and flagship, uh, and seeing what the guns could do. I was absolutely convinced that we were just throwing money down the drain, building battleships instead of carriers. I think most of us in the feet of arm felt the same. The uh, fleet arm, as regarded as a, as a pain by the, the senior officers, these wretched aeroplanes were. Uh, I mean, they had a value for reconnaissance, but that was their limit as far as they were concerned, the majority of them, I think. There were a few exceptions, of course. Dennis Boyd was the absolute classic. Um, 
No, there were several bits to be fair. But the very large majority of the senior officers of the Navy reckoned the battleship was the answer, not the carrier. Not a worry to people like Lord Haw-Haw. Having sunk her by wireless, his lordship made a habit of inquiring, where is the Ark Royal? Asking the question many times. Well, here she is, safe and sound at Portsmouth. The Nazis claim that she had been bombed and sunk was just another typical example of Goebbels lying propaganda. That's all there was to it. Vice Admiral Wells, commanding aircraft carriers, is quite ready to show the Nazi Navy what the ships in his command can do at any time. Meanwhile, let's ask Lord Haw Haw, where is the Nazi Navy? Well, I spent a good deal of time to begin with looking for the Ark Royal. If you remember, there was a great hoo-ha with Lord Haw Haw at the time. Where is the Ark Royal? <laughs> and uh, I was appointed to the Ark Royal, but uh, I couldn't find her either. These were Haw Haw's claims that it, it had been sunk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, actually, she was engaged in the Norwegian campaign, which blew up, you see, very soon after that. The Germans went into Norway. And then um, she went down to the Mediterranean, to Gibraltar. And I, wherever I went, I missed her. And eventually I went out in uh, another aircraft carrier called the Argus from, uh, from Glasgow. And I picked up the Ark Royal in July. It's an extremely interesting job uh, with the aircraft uh, operations. Uh, uh, being in a battleship or a cruiser uh, seemed possibly rather dull after an air, uh, the thought of an aircraft carrier. And I thoroughly enjoyed my time. I loved the Ark Royal. And everyone who did the Ark Royal felt the same about her. Was that because of the leadership on board? I suppose it must have been. There was an excellent captain, a very good commander, or excellent commander, a very good padre, and, of course, the air crew were all um, dedicated people. And the morale of the ship was uh, quite remarkable. If you doubt that Churchill, uh, pardon, Mr. Winston Churchill, MP, could ever speak the truth, you have only to read an interview in the Manchester Daily Whippet. The writer says that when he met the last Lord of the Admiralty, he was lying on a large black settee. I should think that man could lie anywhere. Yeah, turn it up. How many times have I asked you, where is the Ark Royal? But I've got a brand new up-to-the-minute query for you. Where is the Isle of Wight, Mr. Churchill? Answer me that one. My action station was on the bridge, which was very nice. The, I think it was the spearfish, a submarine anyway, was caught on the surface in, um, in the Skagerrak. And it couldn't submerge, and the home fleet went out to bring her in. And we were with the home fleet. And then a, an aircraft came out of the blue and dropped a whacky great bomb. It must have been the size of a bus. It missed us by about 30 yards on the starboard bow. Did a lot of damage. It broke nearly all the animals' crockery, I believe. But other than that, it didn't do any harm. And it... It shook up the home fleet because we were immediately detached, sent round the north coast to what was then called Port A, which was Loch Huey. That was known as Port A. And, um, of course, when the reconnaissance came back, there was no Art Royal. And I think the pilot honestly thought he'd have hit and sunk us. And that was the origin of where is the Art Royal. 
I think they honestly believed at that time they had sungas because it was a very near miss. You were in the Skagrak when you were... Yes, yeah. and we were immediately detached, full speed, mm-hmm. and we went round to Loch Uy. We were then uh, sent from there down to Freetown, crossing the trade routes at night, and they just didn't know where we were because all their reconnaissance didn't show up the ark anywhere. By that time, we were down in, in uh, South Africa or the, the, in Africa. Hitler's misinformed mouthpiece, Lord Hoho, has sunk the ark royal by radio so many times that it is with unbounded delight that we answer his... Where is the Ark Royal? She is here, safe and sound. And in case there are any doubting Thomases in our audience, let us say with all the emphasis at our command that these pictures were taken at Portsmouth in the month of March, in this year of grace, 1940. The Ark Royal is safe. Um, We transferred to Ark Royal and stayed in her until she was sunk, which was what, November 41, wasn't it? About six months, based on jib, and doing various convoy runs up, all the convoys, um, odd raids on bits of Italy, and mainly anti-submarine work. And that's really where I got started on the night anti-submarine stuff, using radar. Well, we've Gibraltar is an awkward place because there was the whole Atlantic on one side and the whole Mediterranean on the other, and we did both. We were never in harbour more than one night. We were either doing a convoy to Malta or we were out to chasing the hipper in the Atlantic, just time to fuel in between. This is one of the reasons, I think, why the Ark Royal was lost, because she never had a chance to have a decent refit during all that time. She was absolutely run into the ground or run into the sea. But it was very exciting. Gibraltar was, you wouldn't think it, but it was an absolute mecca. In what terms? Well, run ashore, beer, all these things which sailors and the officers missed. Again, I don't think there was an admiral in the service um, who's, who had more affection from his troops than Somerville. Um, they thought the world of Somerville and he thought the world of, of, of the Ark and, and Force H. And so the feeling that it was an immensely close feeling, it, it was a family feeling. So I think that, that mitigated against any stress. I, I, I must say, I find it one of the bravest things that the, sea, the seamen admirals had, had managed um, to to take a, a, a force right up into the Gulf of Genoa. We bombarded Genoa and La Spezia, which were the two main... La Genoa, of course, was the main commercial port, and La Spezia was the, uh, the naval port. And I must say, Renown, and, uh, and I can't remember, one or two other big ships, Nelson, uh, you know, those sort of things, got in within range and, and fired off their 15-inch bricks. Uh, and I must say, I think they put more wind up than damage. But and we we shot down the snoopers and things, but there was no sign of uh, the Italian air force uh, attacking our ships. We had to hunt them out. We knocked all the shadows down. I shot down a thousand and seven beasts uh, snooper, great big thing, uh, and and we got absolutely left alone. However, I thought it was a very brave gesture. It was quite early in the war, that one. So that was Genoa. 
Bombing mainly. We did have torpedoing, but uh, mainly bombing, and mainly high-level bombing. We did get, we have dive bombers, but it's mainly high-level bombing, which, in a sense, is more stressful, because you don't know what on earth, then suddenly you see a wacky great thing come up. Now, is the next one going to be with us? Again, you'll see some of those pictures there, where you go through a complete curtain of about four bombs. Think, but thank heaven we weren't going two knots faster. We'd have been in the middle of it. But um, we were lucky in the sense that we never actually got hit. Um, so that we never had this mayhem that you had on board some of the ships. I think the thing that particularly I found fascinating was that we all had our tin hats. We didn't wear them including the captain, and you get a report that enemy aircraft approaching X miles away, enemy approaching X minus five miles away and so on, and everybody would be sort of looking. The moment the captain's tin hat went on, everybody else's went on <laughs> within two seconds. We were, nobody would be the first one to put their tin hat on. They were all, the eye was on the captain. <laughs> the moment his hat went on, everybody else's was on. We bombarded Genoa, but we set off from Jib and put a lot of shells from the Renown and again the Sheffield into the docks at Genoa. And uh, the Ark Royal provided air cover, hanging deck, well out of harm's way, except for the aircraft who came after us later, but they didn't do any damage, and that was them. Um, a very successful operation. And then we had various convoys, of course, which were quite exciting. And by that time, the Nelson had joined us. And um, I remember one convoy attacked by Italian torpedo bombers, I think. And uh, one of them hit the Nelson in the, on the port bow. And... Um, our aircraft were at that time returning from having done some sortie in the fighter patrols and everything, and um, they flew, I suppose, quite close to the Nelson. But anyway, we got a signal from Admiral Somerville saying words to the effect that your boys seem to take an unusual interest in father's pence. I hope nothing is sticking out. The sort of signal he made. And then... Uh, that was really... That was really all until we... When we went on doing these convoys, we went off on a Christmas day to uh, attack the hippo, as I keep on mentioning, which was... Uh, it suddenly appeared attacking a convoy out to the west of Portugal and uh, we didn't get up but we got a couple of merchant ships and that was our routine until the sad day and we came back from one of these trips and at about five o'clock in the evening on a lovely November evening within 18 miles of Gibraltar <coughs> A U-boat got us. The first, the first Christmas at, as Force H, we were in Gibraltar, and uh, Christmas Day arrived, and Admiral Somerville came aboard in the early in the or during the morning, and he was saying how grand it was to be in harbour on Christmas Day. I'd hate to be at sea in this weather, he was saying, what a shocking day it was. And he went back to Renown, and then the signal came, raised steam for full speed in two hours. A convoy had been attacked in the Bay of Biscay. The hippo had attacked a convoy, and we had to shoot out. Many of the ship's company were ashore, didn't get back aboard in time. Many of the pilots had had far too much to drink, but still still flew their aircraft. For my own part, my normal job wasn't on the bridge. 
accepted action stations, but I had to go on the bridge then because my uh, office messenger, whose job was on the bridge, had had too much to drink and couldn't go. Uh, and we went, to, we went to sea in rather a shaky condition, but we, we managed to rescue this convoy and we brought it back without any loss. Then we had uh, Malta convoys, of course. Day one, always very interesting. We were never told, of course, it was a convoy, but we got a lot of a feeling in the air that uh, something was brewing up. Uh, uh, when we were ashore or in harbour, the army were always very hospitable, and we used to visit army messes and so on. And uh, so we were in no fit states when suddenly we found the rumbling. Usually we slipped, went to sea in the dark, so nobody could spot us going. At least it would give us some, some time warning. We knew that there was uh, some German agents in Algeciras with long, long binoculars and things to spot the presence or absence of various ships. So we sneaked out of harbour and Sometimes if we went out in daylight, we'd ste steam westwards into the Atlantic to try and fool the Germans, but it didn't always work. Pick up the convoy and then go eastwards through the straits in the dark. Anyway, D1, they were always very kind to the aviators. They didn't make us fly at all, so D1 was always recovery time. D plus 2, we were flight testing. By this time, we were somewhere halfway towards um, um, Cape Bon, and we had fighter patrol to chase any shadowers in case they turned up. And, of course, D plus three, we were off Galita Island, Cape Bon, written in the minds of all Malta convoy boys, because that was the point where the Axis attack was at its greatest. The whole of the of the third day, we were under bombardment from flotillas of Savoy SM-79s, um, anything up to 36 of them, all in great formations, would come over, and we'd wade into them. We'd managed to shoot down some of them, but uh, I think they were not very keen, the Italians, about being shot down. They... The leaders were very brave men. Um, in those days, the Ark World had not got barriers. And we would land, and having landed and been unhooked, would taxi on to the lift. And the ground crew would then fold the wings, and the aircraft would be struck down. Now, the Ark World had two hangars, and the lift was in two parts. And if you were, your squadron was in the lower hangar, having gone down the first, as it were, floor, you were hauled back by a ground crew, and then the lift went up so that the flight deck was flush again, and you were pushed on to the lower platform of the lift. And then when the aircraft on the top was parked on the lift, it went down again, and you were pulled off, and he was pulled off into that hangar and then pushed on again or left in that hangar, depending which squadron he was in. Now, all the time that this was going on, of course, the ship was steaming into wind and nobody else could land on with the lift down. So you were flying round the ship, waiting to see the lift driver who was on the, on the top deck, see him, as it were, appear again. Then you made a dart for the deck because you knew the lift was going to be up when you got there. And it, when we met the illustrious the first time, we came out of, med, out of the med and met them on their way down the med, we looked quite ridiculous because there they were landing on their aircraft and they landed on the lot in about a quarter of an hour. We were steaming still into wind you know, still half the aircraft to come on because of all this waiting. When the ship went back to Birkenhead, um, the barrier fittings were in the ship, and of course they were brought into operation. And we then started 
using a deck landing control officer. Before, we didn't have a deck landing control officer. We just made our own passes at the deck. And of course, if you missed the wires without the barrier, you could take off again because there was nothing parked up on the bow. But when we had the barrier, then you landed on, the barrier went down, you taxied forward and parked up on the foredeck. The lift didn't go up and down at all until you'd finished landing on. And again, the stories of the former is rather interesting. The former ones were replaced by, by my former twos. And at one time we went back to Portsmouth to bring out the illustrious who was just commissioned. And there was the Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers aboard the illustrious. And on the way back from Portsmouth to Gibraltar, the RAA was constantly moaning at the Ark Royal. What's the RAA? Well, uh, Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers. Uh -huh. uh, Rear Admiral Air. Uh, constantly moaning to the um, Ark. Uh, you're too slow landing on, Ark Royal. You're too slow taking off. And as I say, we had former ones, they had former twos. And we were a bit fed up with this. And uh, all the signals went to Slim Somerville, although he wasn't with us at that time. We went through the Straits of Gibraltar and we were shadowed by uh, an Italian aircraft. And our aircraft went off after it and so did the um, illustrious aircraft. Well, one of our former ones shot down this uh, shadower. So we got signals then from um, uh, from Slim Somerville. Well done, Ark Royal. You may be slower at landing on, but you're certainly quicker at bumping off. <laughs> one of, in one of the occasions, I'd shot down a, a, the chap who turned out to be a duke. I, uh, he was in a torpedo attack aircraft, and he was picked up because I told, told the gang, and I shot him down, uh, and he was still floating, and perhaps it'd be interesting to see what sort of things they got on board. So they sent a destroyer off and picked up this chap, the driver, and and they were trying to get all sorts of equipment on board when the whole thing sank, so that was that, because he still had his torpedo on there. So he went into Gibraltar Harbour, uh, into a hospital at, in Gibraltar, to visit this chap, so I thought perhaps he needs some cheer, cheer up business, see how bad he was, and find out a bit of things from our point of view. And so he turned out to be some sort of duke, so he said anyway. And I asked him why they always, when they dropped their bombs, they used to bomb where the ships weren't. The spaces between the ships were always exploding with enormous uh, plumes of, 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 of brown sea and swim. And when upstairs, looking down, you'd see the whole of the, of, of the fleet with all its cruisers and destroyers and battleships, exports, and the carriers completely obliterated by um, this, the bomb flashes. And it went little by little out of the murk, would poke the leading destroyer, and then the rest of them, and then the cruisers, and then the battleships, and the tail end, then with Tim, the old Ark Royal, by which time, of course, we'd already been wondering where we were going to find our next bed, because we obviously have to go and force land somewhere in Africa, or, or we didn't want to go to uh, Italy or France, so we'd have to be in North Africa. Um, and so we were saved, but it happened so often, I said, you always bomb the holes, you had terrible bad luck. <laughs> what he said was the trouble was, he says that nobody was very keen to fight the British. He, he, was, he was always spoke beautiful English anyway. Uh, and and when when there's a raid on, he says, of course the the uh, Italian fighter element were pretty keen not to do anything about escorting bombers because they thought it would blow their sort of uh, level of society. So they never got much escort from their own fighters. Uh, and they never got much encouragement for their air crew because their air crew were so busy uh, looking after themselves. Uh, they, they were very reluctant and sort of they go adrift. And he said, the mob I've got in that 
played, he said, they didn't even know how to fire the machine guns. And, of course, I discovered afterwards, talking to the doctors, that all of them had got clapped, if you know what I mean. <laughs> They'd all got some form of disease. <laughs> I had to admire this bloke. I mean, knowing the odds were against him the whole time, and he, he was, they were so brave with all this shit being flung at them by the anti-aircraft guns, let alone us little mosquitoes trying to cut out one or two. Of course, every, every raid of 36, we might get about three or so of them down, but it was the threat that put them off, I suppose. But it was such bad luck, because in the entire year that we were doing Malta convoys, I suppose there were about six of them, uh, Ark Royal, we had some fairly near misses, but we survived uh, the whole period. And heaven knows, uh, a lot of, when we did meet the German, the, the, the Italian fighters, they, they didn't, seem to press home their attacks at all. They're much too busy doing fancy aerobatics and so on. However, water convoys is always a nasty business because uh, the convoys then had, at the, when we parted company on D plus three at dusk, which is about six, 6.30, we all heaved a sigh of relief because the Germans didn't fly at night and we didn't do much night flying. And we turned round and went westwards. The convoy then sailed on with its uh, surface escort through the dark, through the Malta Channel, arriving somewhere off Malta at dawn the following day. We, we, we were very thankful on the return trip. We never had any trouble then. <laughs>